You know, I live in Atlanta. And typically, when you run into people in Atlanta, you run into someone who isn't from Atlanta. So when you do run into an Atlanta native, it is always fascinating to me because this is when you run into real Southerners. Now, I grew up in Alabama. So by birthright, I was born a Southerner, but due to the fact that I had the speech impediment, I never developed a Southern accent. So that kind of kept me out of the Southern folks game, so to speak. But today, I went to get some blood work for my doctor's appointment. And I was going through this parking lot attendant and there was a machine and I thought I was gonna put my little you know, card in the machine and put my credit card in the machine. No, no, no. This Southern woman popped out. She took my card, she took my little ticket, she put it in the machine. Then she took my credit card, she put it in the machine. Then she said, stay prayed up. And I knew at that moment, I was dealing with a original, deep down, Southern woman. And this is why this video is about the life of Southern comfort, because like I said, I live in Atlanta. And typically when I encounter someone, they're not from here. So you don't really run into a lot of Southerners. And it got me to thinking about, cause she was stayed prayed up and I looked at her and she was a Grady baby. I know if I had a conversation with her, cause see, that's a, that used to be a thing here in Atlanta. Were you a Grady baby or were you born at Crawford Long? Google it. These are local hospitals and a lot of, Poor people here in the South were born at Grady. Grady and Northside Hospital, when I worked at, they were running neck and neck who had the most births. And that was like a big, big thing. Are you a Grady baby or are you a Crawford Long baby? I mean, this is something that the original Atlanta natives discuss in these big things like Mary Max Tea Room. And I started to think, you know, Bubba Wallace, who is a black NASCAR race car driver, found a new simp in his garage because he made a statement that we shouldn't have Confederate flags. And I was, I was thinking about that. Confederate flags and NASCAR go together like cookies and milk. See, NASCAR drivers, and that's the reason there's Taylor Swift is on the thumbnail. I know a guy who's a NASCAR driver and you know, he's in this powerful machine zooming around this oval and stuff, but he lived on a farm, 12 acre farm with horses, cows and pigs. And his wife would be frequently dressed in a little dress like that with cowboy boots. They were original Georgia born people. And I mean, you know, I would go to the house and stuff and she'd be wearing in the little dress and little cowboy boots and like, hey, Glendon, how you doing? She was always just such a sweet person, just so nice. And how you doing? You want some sweet tea? Very, very nice. And it got me to thinking of the differences between original Southern people and transplants. Because Atlanta, most of the people here are from somewhere else. You know, I have a greater chance of running into someone from New York. I mean, New Yorkers are famous. I mean, I think that's one of the top states that people left to come to Atlanta because I have a greater chance of running into someone from New York than I do running into an original Southern person, an Atlanta native. And the New York people, I remember years and years ago, I was dating this chick and we were out looking at houses cause we were getting serious and thinking about getting married and doing this. And we we're looking at houses. And there was this guy who was undeniably from New York and he was tripping on the home prices. 
The home was like 260 back then. And dude got loud and like, you bullshit. This how, what? All this for two orders, what? You, 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 you messing with me. He could not believe that this five bedroom house sitting on an acre was 206,000. He was just like, he, he, he couldn't believe it. He was having a meltdown and he got on the phone and he's like, look, man, I'm here in Latonia, Georgia. Look, they giving houses. Do you hear me? Understand they are giving houses away. I'm in this house, five bedrooms sitting on the acre. It's 260. You know what this would cost up in New York? You know how much this would cost? We talking millions. Let everybody know we, 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 we come into Atlanta. We come into Atlanta because this is one of the things that would happen. One person would move to Atlanta, then they would alert the whole family and literally the whole family would move down. That's how they were rolling back in the day. I don't know how they do it now, but one would come then the next year, the rest would be here. And this went on for a long time because, you know, it has been so long since I have run into an Atlanta native. That's why, you know, it's just triggered this video because there is such a distinct difference between the Atlanta natives and us transplants. Because even though I was born in Alabama, I qualify as a transplant. My ex-wife was an original Atlanta, Atlanta native. She was a Grady baby. She used to hate new people moving to Atlanta. They different, they're changing the city, they messing up the city. She used to just hate these people because folks were like, at one point we had 10,000 people a month moving to Atlanta and we had 4,000 people leaving. I don't know what the numbers are now. So we had a positive net growth of 6,000 new people moving to Atlanta every month and this was 72,000 new Atlanta people per year. And at some point, the number jumped. And it got me to thinking. Because when I first moved here in 1989, I would frequently run into native Atlanta people. Uh, the Mary Max Tea Room. I forget the name of the restaurant that was up on Cascade. Uh, frequently, I would run into Southern people, Southern comfort. Some ladies I worked with invited me over for a barbecue. They lived in Clayco, Clayton County. And Clayton County back then was a sleepy little community. Nothing happened there. It was just full of country folks. So I get to the house, her husband's back there. He's got the grill fired up. What do you want? You want a burger? You want some hot dogs? Ha <laughs> ha, big as you are, you probably want both. I'm gonna slap both of them on the grill for you. And he did. He put two burgers and two hot dogs on the grill. It's like, those got your name on the man, they got your name. How you doing? You work with my wife, she talks about you a lot. So you were stationed in Hawaii, huh? How was it out there in Hawaii? And we were just, you know, it, it was just, when you ran into original native Southern people, they were so friendly. They were so nice. They were so accommodating. They were so welcoming. I mean, he just treated me like I was a long lost cousin. Put the, the burger, the hot dogs on the grill, and you say, hey, you look like you need some Southern comfort. It's like, it's over there. Go ahead and get you a little bit. Get you a little taste. Get you a little taste. And the, the thing in that I miss about the original land of natives was that down home welcoming spirit. 
Because you go downtown Atlanta now, it's like being in New York City. Nobody ain't going to say nothing to you. You just moving. And that, that's something that used to be the norm when I got here. That everybody would say, how you doing? And this is something, once you get outside of Atlanta, and you have to go further and further. Because it used to be, you just had to go to Austell, Douglasville. Or you, you would run a Conyers. You run into that just like that. But now, those folks have been pushed out. And every time I travel, I'm on the road, and I go through one of these little towns, and I hear that little accent, I start to miss the old Atlanta. You know, I've been in Atlanta since 1989. Been here a, a good long time. And the Atlanta that I arrived at Fort McPherson no longer exists. It doesn't exist anymore. There's a few Grady Babies, Crawford Long Baby conversations. I have a few friends who are Atlanta natives and they get together with their other Atlanta natives and they have their little parties and little reindeer games and stuff. But it's so different. It is so different than the current state of Atlanta. Because I remember like, this has fundamentally changed dating. When I arrived in Atlanta in 1989, it was so easy to date. You could meet a girl on Monday and like, hey, you know, my name's Glendon. What, what do you, well, let's go out Friday, okay. And this is on Monday. And rest assured, Friday comes, I would go to her house and either she would be ready or she would be getting ready. I didn't have to send a confirmation text. Are we still on? It wasn't like that. It was, it was so different. It was so interesting. And it, it, it's just everything has changed in Atlanta. Because when you deal with the original Atlanta natives, the original Southern people, there's a different representation to how they get down and how you're treated and how they show you Southern hospitality. Because in parts of Georgia, there's still Southern hospitality. Like I said, you drive about an hour outside of Atlanta, you're, you're heading towards Savannah and you get to the middle gap, that middle area that's about two hours outside of Atlanta, two hours outside of Savannah and you would start to run into it. You would start to run into these church festivals and you would run into these churches where every, ch every Sunday they have fried chicken, potato salad, collard green, green beans and cornbread and sweet tea at the church dinner. You still have all that going out in all of these little small towns where strangely, it's where all of these five star Division one athletes come from. Frequently, you get all of these athletes from these little nowhere towns and they go to Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, you know, LSU, and they become the, the talent that they, and they get into the NFL and when they're doing the ESPN 30 for 30 and they go back to their little town. Well, they named the high school after this dude because that was the biggest thing to come out of there. Everybody was proud of this dude who played high school football at Pooler High School, made it to the NFL, and every time he goes home, everybody's like, man, we so, we so proud of you. That Southern pride, that Southern happiness. It's a strange thing to observe is an outsider because when she, you know, went to the thing and she took my card and everything, she said, stay prayed up. And I looked at her, you see, there's something else too. The native Atlantans have a certain look. They have a way of dressing. They have a way of speaking. They have a way of living. And it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's, it's kind of, cause you know, it has been so long since I've run into a native Atlantic. And this is like 
this just triggered all of these memories because, like I said, Atlanta ain't what it used to be. Atlanta ain't even close to what it used to be. And I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but whenever I run into that Southern comfort, it triggers good memories. Because I remember going to her house and his name was George. Her name was Mary. And I was just invited into their house and they cooked me food and fed me liquor. Like I was a long lost son. This is how Southern people used to get down. Like my friend who is the NASCAR driver. Every time I would go out to their farm, I mean, it would crack me up. This chick was always in cowboy boots and dresses. And one day I went out to the farm and I saw her toward, toward the front of the property on a horse in a dress with those cowboy boots and a hat on. And she saw me, she took her hat off and howdy. Cause she had the country ass accent. I mean, she was country as all get out. And this is one of the things that you see. You see some of this in Texas, especially those cowboy boots. Cowboy boots are here in Georgia, but not like Texas. I was stationed at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and I saw a lot of that cowboy stuff. And as you go to the South, people are different. Like the black folks in Texas are radically different than the black folks in Georgia. And the black folks in Louisiana are different than the black folks in Texas, but not that much because they have shared industries between the Texas border and Louisiana. There's a lot of oil refineries and you have a lot of these roughnecks out there. But one of the craziest things to happen is today I realized how many years it has been since I have run into a native Atlantan? I was just like, wow. Now, I will tell you a place where you can find some. Mary Max Tea Room, downtown Atlanta. It, it, you know, you're gonna have some of the best chicken and macaroni and cheese. The Varsity, downtown Atlanta. There's a restaurant off West Paces Ferry. I don't remember the name, but I think it's the OK Cafe. You were running into a lot of them. Last time I had a meal there, they it was throwing a party for a guy who worked there 30 years as a waiter. 30 years. Because this is one of the things that you, you would run into. Because every now and then, you'll go somewhere and one of them will pop up. You'd be like, oh my God. You, you born here in Atlanta. Yeah, I was. And then whenever you get in around a bunch of Atlanta natives, they start talking about the high school they went to. Doug, Thero, Benjamin Mays. You know, y'all were nothing. And also something else. That when I arrived here in Atlanta, it was the first time I was exposed to black wealth. Because I came in through... Fort McPherson, which is just around the corner from Greenbrier Mall. And Greenbrier Mall was over there by Southwest Atlanta. And this is where the Omega Sci-Fi frat house was. And this is when I started to run against young black folks driving Mercedes and BMWs that their fathers bought them because their fathers were wealthy. And I started to experience, because this is why because if you didn't know, Atlanta is a big source for black wealth. Maynard Jackson's children get a trust fund that he set up before he died. And I started to see all of this thing and to start to see a different side of black society. And you know, the first night I got here, came through the West End Mall. The West End Mall was vibrant. There was vendors out there selling their wares. And literally from once you got off I-20 and turned on to Lee Street, there was all these vendors. There was all this activity. There was people selling 
clothing, people selling food. It was, it was active. It was moving. It was bustling. Things were going on. And I, I went to Fort McPherson. Incidentally, I had to go back home because there was no CQ at Fort McPherson. Fort McPherson was like a country club in the military. It was nothing like what I had left. I had left Schofield Barracks. I left the 25th ID, Tropic Lightning. And I went to this country club. And even, you know, at Fort McPherson, they was like, oh, he's from Division. They were treating me strange. I was like, I had new man status for about two months. Oh, I heard about you. You're from the 25th ID. I was like, who are you? People were talking. Communities were small. Like I said, it was a different world back then. It was a different era. It was a different flavor. It was a different way of being. And the place was so different. And I ran into... This is a land of native today, and she just reminded me of Southern comfort. And those were some good memories. Those were some really good memories that, of the things that I used to experience on a daily basis. But not so much now. It's so rare, which jogged this video to discuss how Atlanta used to be and how Atlanta isn't like that anymore. Atlanta's nothing like that anymore. We, we don't, like I said, every now and then you will go into a restaurant or a business that is run by an Atlanta native and they'll bring some of that charm back, like Mary Max Tea Room, but it ain't like that no more. It ain't like that no more. You know, Atlanta is so distinctly different than Alabama because I was brought up in Alabama and you know, being the son of a South, you, you speak the language and you can communicate with the people, but there are distinct differences because Atlanta was way more progressive than Alabama. Do you know that Hartsfield Airport was slated to be in Birmingham? Because when I was growing up, Birmingham was considered the Pittsburgh of the South. We had all of the natural ingredients for making iron. We had the iron oil, the iron ore. We had the coal. And believe it or not, Birmingham was a wealthy city. And because of the massive racism in Alabama and Birmingham, they're like, we're not going to put this airport here. And that's how Atlanta got the airport. Do you understand? that that airport would have totally transformed the city of Birmingham like it did for Atlanta. But they were like, we, we can't do that. Y'all, y'all, y'all too rowdy. Y'all rowdy, rowdy up here. It's kind of sad that people were so racist that they would, cause see racism is different. Like, a racist will do business with you today if they have economic benefit. Back then, they like, I don't care. Don't care. I cut my nose off. I cut my right arm off because I'm racist like that. Alabama had a whole different level of racism back in the day. It was crazy. But it, it's something to think. Like if you ever come to Atlanta and you see someone with that little twang and that little light in their eyes, no that you're dealing with an Atlanta native. You're dealing with something special because there ain't that many of them anymore. It's a dying breed.